Okay. Again, good morning, everyone. If you're watching us offline, and if you have any uh, opportunity to join us online, please do so next time. I'll be very happy to see you, if, especially if you join this video, but if not, that's okay too. Uh, please, please be online with us. Stay, stay after, ask questions, participate as much as you can. This, this is a good experience uh, for you. Uh, also, the, do the homework. If you are, some of you, I noticed, uh, are submitting homework on time, and that's great. And a little late, that's up to Oksana. But if you wait, like, and not submit four homeworks, and then start to work on the four homeworks, it's um, it's not ideal. So consider spacing it out, like timing it out, because it will be the same as like I, I'm going to the gym every day, and and it will be the same if I don't go to the gym for a month, and then I come and I exercise for 24 hours a day, and that's not the same, right? It's, it's just crush me. So. It's the same with homework. It's meant, I meant it to be spaced a little bit so that you can work on your skills appropriately. So, so please, please don't neglect it for too long. Good. Okie dokie. Uh, let's see. So now we can, now we can start this lecture. And if you have any questions, ask them now. This is our lecture 20 in high dimensional probability and applications to data science. And this will be our last in the series of five <clears throat> lectures focused on applications. Then we will uh, switch back to foundations, uh, mathematical foundations, and we will keep working on that maybe for three or four or five lectures, and then again, we'll have applications. Good. So last class, last time, we illustrated this kernel trick that ar arose from um, our proof of growth and decay inequality. We illustrated it in, in machine learning namely for the binary classification problem one of the one of the most simple problems that you can ask and then foundation foundational problems in machine learning binary classification problem here we we want to classify um, points for example we have test we, we want to build a diagnostic machine something that would diagnose cancer. And so we have patients, they, they take tests, let's say D tests, maybe 10 tests each. And then from that test, the machine, the algorithm is supposed to predict if the person has cancer or not. We need training data for that machine so the machine can learn on something. So the algorithm will learn on the training data, which comes in this form, each data, is a labeled data. So there are, uh, these are, let's say, test results, XIs are test results. And maybe each person has D test results. So little D denotes how many of them, it's dimension, in a, inherent dimension of the problem. And YI is the diagnosis. Um, let's say plus or minus one, plus for cancer, minus one for no cancer. This is our training data. We have, let's say, n, n, test, uh, n people who have already been diagnosed manually by professionals, and we would want our machine to learn on that, to learn on the experience of the professionals. So here is how this may look like in high dimensional space. These x eyes, I'm, I'm pointing to these points denote x eyes. Uh, this is an. Uh, idealized situation of course but but this is this is the point sex size and by red i denoted the cancerous and by minus one no cancerous patients okay so if we see that picture we let's say an idealized picture of course but we can see that they're separated the cancerous and non-cancerous if that happens then it's clear what we want the diagnostic machine to do. 
we would like to separate the, uh, the cancer from non-cancer, something like that, right? So we'd like to build a, a hyperplane so the learning, the learning stage is where the algorithm receives this data and finds and learns. So it finds um, a hyperplane, which lets, uh, which is described by the normal vector, let's say W, so that on the cancerous patient, the, all the cancerous patients lie on one side of the hyperplane and non-cancerous to the other side of the hyperplane. Um, and that, let's say we can describe it like this, let's say greater than one if there is cancer, less than, okay, this time I'll have to agree with Oksana, she suggested to do minus one last time. So let's do minus one so for, for simplicity. If yi is minus one, no cancer. So in this case, we actually have a little bit of separation here. There is a, not only the hyperplane that separates them, but a little bit of like a fatter like a layer uh, that separates them. It's a very idealized situation. No, nothing happens in practice, but we'll start with that and then we'll build up. So in other words, I can put it in one equation, wxi. E, if you multiply it by yi, by the label, cancer, no cancer, it should always be greater than one. Okay, so if that, ha if that is possible at all, such w can be found because that each inequality for w is a linear inequality. It's like, it defines a half space where w can live. And then we intersect all these half spaces, we get some thing and computer can do this by solving a linear program. So it's a linear, it's a linear feasibility program. There are algorithms, you can just put it there and the algorithm receives training data. It spits out, it outputs the W and the W gives us a prediction. So once we solve this problem, we can make, we can diagnose people. Our prediction would be um, the diagnosis of a new patient. So we, we, the patient comes to us, we tell him, okay, just go and take these tests, D, D tests, blood tests, whatever, um, and get us test results, X, and the diagnosis will be this. We'll look at W, X, I, and uh, what? And we just take the sign. Yeah. That's it. That's our prediction. Give plus or minus one. Good. Okay, so that's a, that's a kind of a baby version of, of binary classification. That's how we do this. It's a baby version for many reasons. One reason is that um, the data cannot be perfectly separable. It could possibly be, and I'm modifying this picture now, it could possibly be that there are some cancerous patients here and some non-cancerous patients here. In fact, there will always be things like that. Maybe because maybe it is because the, the doctors made a mistake. Or maybe because the tests don't show you everything about cancer. There, are, there could be tests that are just inconclusive. So what do we do then? Then there, then such W doesn't exist. And then this if you if we put it. If you try to find the W like that, it, the program will just say empty set, can't be solved. And we're not happy about this. So we would need to, um, we would need to allow some outliers. So if this is a new, new material now, so if the data is not perfectly like, yeah, perfectly, uh, separable, linearly separable, like in this picture, then we want to allow bad points, such as like outliers, the points that are misclassified by uh, 
by the doctors. And here is the idea, and I, I'm sure, I apologize to the people who already know this because they, they probably work in machine learning, but maybe if you don't, then, then you just stay with me and we will get to something uh, new for you too. So now if, if we want to allow some outliers, we switch our viewpoint. Instead of making a very hard requirement that all points do this, we switch to the optimization viewpoint. We penalize. We penalize every bad point. So think of it like this. We, we pay penalty. Penalty. All right, let's see. So we want this, what penalty? We, we want this to be greater than one for any i. And if that does not happen, we pay this penalty for every bad point. So this is how much dollars we pay for every bad point. <laughs> uh, and then we would like to minimize our penalty. So how do we do this? Let's say the total penalty is called the loss, our losses, right? So that's how that's how much we pay. Loss, depending on W, we sum over all patients, we sum the penalties over all patients. And the penalty is this for the for each bad point. Okay. For each point where it is positive. And if this penalty is negative, we don't pay it. So I'll just put a little plus here, indicating that whenever this number drops down below zero, whenever a penalty is negative, we don't actually pay it. So this means that we do something like this. Here is a penalty. It's like that. This is a function. This is a function one minus t plus. So plus is, if the number is positive, we, if the number is positive, it's a number. If the number is negative, then it's just zero. We just replace with zero. This function is called hinge loss in machine learning. So we have the hinge loss. We set up the hinge loss and we minimize, then we minimize the hinge loss over all Ws. The hinge loss is obviously convex from this picture. And if we sum convex function, it's convex. So we have still a convex program. Here we go. So this is, a, this is our new approach to this. We introduce penalty for every bad point. We sum all these penalties, and we, then we minimize our total penalty, which is called the loss by a convex program. And it's possible, now it's possible that there are some bad points. That's fine. Um, the loss will not be zero, but it will be minimal, as small as possible. So that's how you handle outliers. OK, good. Any questions so far? OK, still a convex program, still can do. Very good. Now we've handled outliers. For practical purposes, we also um, we also regularize this loss. So, in fact, in we add we we would like the w. So far, the w actually is not the w is any vector. It could be very very large, has very very huge norm, has very small norm. And if it has a very huge norm, it the problem becomes that's unstable. It's just WXI will be huge, huge number. We don't want to do that. So we usually also penalize the norm of W to improve stability, to improve robustness of the algorithm. So something like this, lambda is some number, maybe one half or something. Lambda W norm squared. So just a length of that vector. This is called the regularization procedure. And that you can already solve. This is this is called the soft margin SVM uh, support vector machine.
this is the algorithm that's very, very popular, very well known. And if we are, if we believe that the data may be linearly separable, at least in some approximate sense, then then this is the way to go. Okay, good. Any questions about this? That's good. All right, perfect. So suppose now the the data is not linearly separable, and that we are now repeating what we said last time. Suppose there is instead of um, instead of a hyperplane like this the data is separated by some surface like that and not linearly. And then what do we do? We discussed that last time. What was the, the solution if, if we have a situation like this, like this maybe? What was the kernel the trick? Hmm? Say it again. Uh, we do the kernel trick. Kernel trick, exactly, exactly. We either, so we do the kernel trick, which means that we, um, either we embed in the high, in a higher dimensional space. Let's say in this case, it would make sense to put it on the sphere so that the blue points uh, land on the top, like near the North Pole. And then we can linearly separate them. We can separate the North Pole, like in the North, uh, whatever the polar, polar region from the rest of the region just by linearly separating them. Or better yet, we don't guess the embedding itself. And that's that's a beauty of the kernel trick that we don't have to guess it. We um, we kernelize and let me explain again what that means. So if the data is not linearly separable, which is most of, which you should not assume, right? So if the data is not linearly Separable, we we do the kernel trick. Okay, so the kernel trick, without guessing the actual embedding, works like this: we rewrite the algorithm in terms of inner products. And then replace every inner product by some kernel, by some function x, y. Instead of taking inner product f, x, y, you just replace it with some function that you you like. Okay, let's do it. Um, the loss. Let's read. Let's look at the loss. Uh, how do okay? How do we inner products? So for this, for this, let's say I take w of this form, just a linear in, linear combination. Lambda alpha j x j. I can always assume that that the solution is in the linear span of the points. Okay, so then I rewrite the loss. Then one minus. Okay, now w times x i. So this is going to be by linearity of the product alpha j x i x j y j i believe correct me if i'm wrong but i think i'm correct Lambda. and the norm squared the norm squared that's the inner product with itself so that would be the sum of i and j alpha i j x i x j oh no 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 it's, it's going to be alpha sorry alpha i alpha j x i x j I just substituted W there and opened everything and it should work that way. Right. But but it's probably YI under the sum because it comes from the YI, original. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. And then this becomes a, a linear a program in alpha. And so we minimize in alpha J's. This is our new variables. So we changed variables basically. Okay, and then the prediction. So this is a, this is learning, and we rewrite the prediction in the same form. Also in terms of the linear products of inner products. So f of x is the sine of 
sum of alpha j x x j. Okay, perfect. All right. So the point of this little exercise was just to rewrite the the our algorithm in terms of inner products only. We did that. And now we replace it by kernel. So now we imagine, but not, not necessarily explicitly, just imagine that we transform our data nonlinearly from the original dimension D into some, into some higher dimension. Maybe it's a, like, even in Hilbert space. And if you don't like thinking about Hilbert spaces, for example, for example, R capital D into some space. So we transform all this data. So X now goes to phi of X and the inner products will be transformed, of course, into phi of X, phi of Y, like this. And we call this the kernel. So we call this K of X, Y. And now we forget about phi. <laughs> just choose a nice kernel k and replace the all inner products by k of x y for example just to think of something specific the radial basis function that we discussed last time looks like this the gauss kind of a gaussian kernel So this is a specific example of, and I think the most popular kernel available. Like this, it corresponds to, actually it corresponds to putting points on the sphere as we discussed last time. And so that's why it's nice. It's really curves everything up and allows very nice linear separations. Good, and then we just do that. So let me, you don't have to write this, but let me, let me try to rewrite this now. The original algorithm i'm removing the inner products and i'm putting the kernel just so we have the idea of how this xi xj how this looks like and this is xi xj2 so i'm kernelizing this algorithm x xj x xj here we go done so this is our new algorithm kernelized and k k for example is this And that thing is called the kernel version of the algorithm. In this case, it's called the kernel support vector machine. That's, that's what it is. Very simple algorithm. The beauty of this is that even though the nonlinearity can be very difficult, the algorithm itself is not getting more difficult. The algorithm is still in alphas. Right? There is no, com no added complexity in alphas at all. We didn't change anything about alphas. Okay, so that was the kernel trick. And then you, <clears throat> this one you can actually implement on the, on the computer. Just a little warning, guys, if you, do, if you want to implement exactly this algorithm, I'm not sure how well it works. You need a little bit of kind of little tweaks for practical implementation. And you look at Wikipedia, what tweaks there are. You just, usually you need the offset uh, and you need, um, and usually you kernelize the dual form of this algorithm. So you, for, you first apply Lagrange multiplies and then you dualize, but that's, those are practical aspects of this specific algorithm. Um, the idea is there. The idea is actually very good and it, it, it works. So this is how it works. Let's see. Did I include it somewhere? Okay. Yeah, this is how it works for the radial basis functions, for example. These are the points. And the kernel was radial basis functions. But it does a pretty good job. There are some misclassifications, but overall, it's, it's pretty good. And there are libraries that implement this kernel SVM. So you can play with them yourself if you like. So, uh, so, so these shapes in, in this image, so I, I'm uh, just having a hard time to imagine, like you mentioned that uh, this uh, uh, kernel is, uh, is just projecting on the sphere in, in high dimensional space. 
Mm -hmm. So these these contours is just a slice of the high dimensional sphere with one. Uh, yes, yes. Is uh -huh. it doesn't just project on the sphere, but it also projects nonlinearly. So it puts it on the sphere, but it puts it in very strange position. So it's like on the sphere there is also a nonlinear transformation of the sphere itself. Uh huh. Okay. I'll let me. I think you will understand this better if I tell you this. Let's see what you're talking about. Sorry. Um, yeah, look at this kernel. If X and Y are very far from each other, so we have very far points, then what's the kernel? K of X, Y. So x minus y square will be very large, minus large will be infinity. So exponential of infinity will be zero. So kernel will be almost zero, right? So this means that after, and kernel is, is this, right? <clears throat> so that after transformation, the inner product is almost zero. So it means that the vectors after transformation are almost orthogonal to each other, okay? So what, that, what does that mean? It means that if you start with the initial points and this, the, the, the points that are far away will be put in a position that are very orthogonal to each other. It's a huge dimensional space. So it will, it will try to create as much as possible room uh, among the large points. And the points that are small, uh, that are close to each other, if you linearize exponential, they will be almost linearly, just almost the geometry will be preserved. So this means that this, this map is, is strange. It's not just a projection on the sphere, like stereographic projection, for example. You just contract to the sphere. It's something else. It also kind of moves the points around. And that's how it attempts to create this, this things, these images. May I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, are these curves at least, is this curve, um, how do I say it? Um, is it is this a one curve? So can can I get like a, um, a circle somewhere and another disconnected circle from it? If yes. I want to. See it? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Well, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, that should not be very surprising though, right? So it's like I don't know. This is like a slice of some hypersurface. So imagine you have like a mountain surface and then you slice it. You can have circles there disconnected, right? You can have connected curves and um, yeah. It's almost like and, a terrain through which you slice. So you can have. And this is possible if, even for, for this kernel or? Yeah, 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 even for this kernel, absolutely. Yeah, it doesn't have to be connected, I think. Yeah, in fact, I, I don't know if you see this, but there are little co contours, there are little dotted lines like this uh, shown here. And this is what would happen if you, if you sliced a little bit higher. There is a parameter lambda. So if you sliced a little bit higher, it would, it would separate the red points like this, I think, with, a, with different regularization. It will actually be the circles. It depends on the um, on the sigma. The sigma is kind of a, plays a role as a variance, but here it really measures the neighborhood that it tries to capture. It tries to put na na it tries to preserve the kind of the geometry of this neighborhood of sigma neighborhoods, and it tries to move the different neighborhoods apart from them itself from each other. That's how it kind of clusters things about. So. Yeah, thank you, Maxime, for the question. Any anything other? Any else? Other questions? Good. Okay, perfect. Now, question. Question is this. Well, this is all works like miracle, but really, can we just take any function, just throw there any function, and and it works? Well, yeah, I, I, I will also, also be noting, nodding like this. No, it can. We can technically we can do this, right? And they can just put this any function in the algorithm and it will spit you something, maybe, you know, hopefully. But how do we know it has any you know, connection with reality? 
we can't really hope to, to put any function there. Because for one thing, let's say you put x and x. k of x, x has to be positive then, right? Because an inner product of itself is positive. So there are, there are some restrictions on the functions that you, you must choose. And that is something that we would like to, to understand now. So what functions are kernels? What do kernels look like even? What can you put there in this algorithm? One thing that, uh, that is clear is that for any, let's say, if you, if you take the data and look at this kernel, just evaluate, evaluate the kernel on the data itself like this. You get a matrix, okay. And that matrix is phi of x i, phi of x j. And what do you see here? What is this? What is this matrix? What does it look like to you? Phi of x i, phi of x j. We had some matrices like this before. Inner products, stores inner products. I have a name. Gram matrix. Gram matrix, exactly. It's a matrix that stores all inner products. It's a gram matrix. And as you discovered in the homework, gram matrices are all positive semi definite matrices as the same class. So it must be positive semi definite. So that is a restriction on K. And in fact, it's only restriction. Any K that satisfies it is a kernel and vice versa. So the Mercer the th theorem, that's, that's a theorem, Mercer's condition. <laughs> let's say, let's say formally that a kernel is, uh, so K is a kernel, K, X, Y, let's call it a kernel formally, if, this matrix if all kind all matrices like this are positive semi-definite is positive semi-definite for any choice of evaluation points and the condition is that any continuous kernel works so any continuous kernel, for any continuous kernel, there is a there is this map phi. The feature map phi. So the k of x, y is phi of x, phi of y. And the significance of this result is that, that such k works is valid for the kernel trick. So this is the only assumption, only condition that we need is to check the positive semi-definiteness of, of the kernel. And if you think about the theorem, it's not that hard actually. This theorem is a is an infinite dimensional version of the homework problem. Like any positive semi-definite matrix is a gram matrix. It's only a continuous version of it when we replace X and Y with I and J's, but, but really it's, 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 this is like an infinite dimensional version of the homework problem. Where you take this, linear algebra fact that any gram matrix is positive semi-definite and vice versa and then you take the limit of it and the continuity the assumption that the kernel is continuous is allowing you to take limits so that's that's the idea over here it will not prove it for formally it's really boring okay so that that is a condition it's normally it's it's, it's hard this is condition is hard to to, to check in practice and you have to 
look at all possible XIs and you took these huge metrics and how do you know it's positive semi-definite and this, you have to do it theoretically. So no one likes to do this, but what it allows us to do is using simple kernels, it allows us to build more complicated kernels. This theorem justifies the rules by which we can build the kernels. And that is, so Mercer's theorem allows us to build kernels. So for example, let me give you a simple example. If K and M are kernels, then so is K plus M. Right, from this Mercer's condition, it's clear. If two metrics are positive semi-definite, we add them up, we know that the result is positive semi-definite. So that's, that's it. And so on and so forth. And then you, you can multiply things, you can add things, you can raise them to any power. Let's say K square is also a kernel. And that is because when you square a uh, positive semi-definite matrix, it's also positive semi-definite and so on and so forth. So Mercer condition is difficult to check itself, but it allows us to understand what kind of building blocks they are and how to build the new kernels. And then I'll, or maybe I'll just stop this discussion now because it's, it's kind of clear that you can build these kernels and there are libraries of kernels that you would already predefined for you. And, and if you don't, if you think that you need a new kernel, you just build your new kernel using this and that's fine. But any questions about this topic? What, what functions are kernels, how to build them? Good. Good. Uh, kernels are also, it's not very clearly understood yet, but kernels play an, an important role in this in the new um, in the new methods based on neural networks, and this is what I would like to discuss today. So kernels and neural networks. In fact, kernels provide us with the best theoretical under not best, but with what was some of the theoretical understanding of, of what neural networks are able to do. Okay, guys, how many of you know what a neural network is? Artificial neural network, just you know, raise your whatever. Artificial hand, <laughs> okay. Okay, cool, good, 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 good. That's what I thought, like five people know and the rest don't know, perfect. Well, I'll discuss them very briefly and, and you can of course read in popular literature on them. It's very, it's neural networks as you probably heard all of you. It's, uh, it, they're one of the most popular tools, probably the most advanced tools now in machine learning. And they are modeled after our kind of human brain neural network. Maybe not model, maybe this is like a metaphor of our human brain network rather. And here's, here's how, they, how we define them. You first define a neuron, a building block of our brain and a building block of the artificial neural network too. And the neural, neuro, the, a neuron is just a composition. It, what it does, it composes a linear and nonlinear function. So here's a, here's a, my idealized version of the neural, of the neuron, like an octopus like this. Here's the input, here's the output. There's a neuron that let's say on input X1, X2 and X3, the neuron adds them up with some weights, W1, W2, and W3. So it adds them up, W1, X1, plus W2, X2, plus W3, X3. Adds the input and it's a linear combination. So, so far everything is linear and then it applies a nonlinearity. Sigma where Sigma is a, a nonlinearity activation function, they call it. 
and nonlinear linearity that is meant to gauge if the neuron will fire further uh, the information or, will, or or not. The neuron can kind of decide whether fire or not. And the nonlinearity may be like this, for example, or it may be like this, which is a sine function. And in this, in this, just in this discussion, let's assume that it's a sine function. So it either fires plus or one or plus or fires minus one. But generally, it could be. Any. Okay, good. That's good. Okay, this is a neuron, one neuron. In fact, what we discussed before, this support vector machine is a neuron because what it does is exactly this. It, it, um, that should be X actually, X. What it does, it computes the, the sum, W i x i s and then applies a nonlinearity. So the support vector machine, the prediction of the support vector machine is a neuron. One single neuron. So let's remark this SVM is a neuron because the prediction was like this sine w one x one plus w n x n w dxd and in the support vector machine the parameters were w w's the weights so we train we trained the weights of the neuron w so the support vector machine, we can think of this as one single neuron in which we train the neuron, we train the weights of that of these connections, the axons, I believe they're called. And we train these connections to perform a, a task. And that task was a linear classification. Okay. Okay. Good. So what's a neural network? It's a combination of, of neurons. We put a lot of them together to work. A neural network. is a combination of neurons. Uh, let me describe a simple neural network. Let's say with one input layer, one hidden layer, and one output like this. This is one neuron. It receives the input again x1, x2, and x3. It multiplies by the weights and then outputs. But there are other neurons here. And they do the same thing. They have different weights and they they are doing their own thing here. Ooh, and maybe what else do we have green this green 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 beautiful that's our artificial neural network it consists of four neurons this time and what they do is they receive the input then they multiply it by the weights let's say in this red the first neuron has weights u Let's say, I don't know, U11, U12, U13, and U14. And the other weights are U21, U22, and so on and so forth. And then it multiplies it by the weight W1. W4. In the last layer, the last neuron is also a neuron. It takes the inputs from the previous 
neurons, combines them, applies nonlinearity, and outputs. Okay, so every every node here is a corresponds to applying an, a linear a linear combination of the input and the nonlinearity, and it fires further. So it's just a composition. Okay, is new neural network clear? The architecture clear? What it does? Yeah, everything is. Yeah. Perfect. If something is not clear, ask me now. If you if if you're seeing it the first time. Okay. Cool. This is this is that, and we train. We train the weights. And the way there are a lot of weights there. There's U I J's and there are W J's. I guess to perform some task like classification, for example. So that's it. That's a neural network. Now, where's kernels? Hold on. So connection to kernels. Okay. So here, this is how something interesting. Let's think about what does this neural network do? It takes the input, and the input has dimension three. It then, using this network, it it um, transforms it in dimension four. And then it applies the linear classification. So this transformation from dimension three to dimension four is a sum nonlinear transformation, phi. And so the first layer, the first layer realizes, or computes a feature map, a non, non uh, Nonlinear, okay, let's just a nonlinear map. Phi. This in this example from dimension three to dimension four, but really it's from dimension D to dimension something else. Uh, what is it? It's uh, well, what does the red the red neuron do? The red neuron computes the, the sine of W sine of UX. Right, so the first one is sine of u one x. So some nonlinear function, and apply it, and then we apply nonlinearity, which we assume to be the sign. The second one, the black neuron, applies the same thing, and the blue and the green, and the last one u uh, d x. Actually, let's call it n. Sorry. Not capital D, but little n. Okay, so that's our nonlinear function. Agreed? The first layer of the neuron applies this nonlinearity. It corresponds to the kernel. What kind of kernel? Let's check. A of x, y. And you will see something fascinating here. The kernel is phi of x, phi of y. Let's compute it explicitly. Um, so we have the sine inner product. So I'm taking the inner product of these two vectors, one with x, one with y. So how do we take inner product? We multiply sine of uix by sine uiy, just like that. Yeah, that's the inner product. Okay, let me cheat a little bit. Let me just no introduce a normalization, one over n. So maybe I, instead of the sine function, I also normalize it like one over n. That's possible. Okay, so now it's an interesting thing. Let's let's do this. Let's um, to understand how what this looks like. Let's initially initialize the weights at random. So initialize the weights, all weights, UIJs as random, normal, zero, one, IID. So this UIs, they are normal vectors in dimension N. Why do we do this? Because we don't know how to initialize them any other way. <laughs> That's what people do actually in practice. We train these weights. 
but in order to start with something, we start we'll start with well, we, we can start with zero weights, but it will introduce a little bit of you know, rigidity. So we usually initialize them at, at random and then let them train. Okay, so we initialize them at random. So what is this? UIs are random now, independent, and we take the sum, like the average sum. Where does it converge as n goes to infinity? If we let n go to infinity. It's a normalized sum of random variables. Right? So we have this probability law, the, the law of you know the normalized sum converting. <laughs> Tell me what the, the law of large numbers. Right? The normalized sum converges to the expectation. So it converges to the expectation of sine ux, sine uy, if n goes to infinity. So if the middle layer expands to infinity. So you can make a, a very, very ultra wide network. Okay, good. And that we computed. This is growth index identity. That we computed. This is two over pi arc sine some nonlinear function x, y. So if you make an, a very wide, ultra wide network, what it does in the first layer, let's say, it just computes some kernel. It attempts to compute a kernel, at least at the initialization step. So the summary is the neural network computes the kernel. And then what it does after computing the kernel, it applies uh, the sine wx. That's what this does. So this neural network is a kernel SVM, the kernel support vector machine, just as we discussed before, only with this funny kernel, not with radial basis kernel, but with some, some funky arc sine kernel. Right, so this particular instance of a neural network that we described at least at the initialization, when we initialize everything at random, and maybe, so we can initialize this at random and we train only that. That is equivalent to the kernel SVM. Okay, good. All right. Now, if this is good, why, why do people need neural networks, right? <laughs> just, just do the kernel SVM. I just computed it's an arc sign. Why do we need the neural network to compute that? Does it compose nicely if we have uh, multiple layers, for example? Yeah, let's have we have we don't have one layer, but we have let's say two layers, middle layers. But we can again think of this as like a composition of two uh, nonlinear functions, and we can uh, compute in this case explicitly. Even I think we can compute for ultra wide network. We can compute the uh, the, cur the corresponding kernel. And if there are three middle layers, we can also compute the inner kernel for wide ultra wide networks. And this is what people did. It's actually there are books written on this about how to compute these kernels. Um, the book is called actually, I think, Gaussian Limits of Neural Networks, something like that. Um, so we can, yeah, the, the wide networks, they correspond to, to kernel methods, to the kernel trick and nothing else. But there is something, <laughs> something else. What is that something else? What do you think? Something else why neural networks actually are not reducible to just saying that it's just a kernel method. If they were reducible, then why? We should not need them. Just take the kernel method directly and produce it. Actually, I don't. I'm asking you as if I did, as if I knew myself, but I don't quite know. But um, one thing that that we can guess is that what we described only happens at initialization when we just set these weights as Gaussian as normal. Okay, then it is a kernel. But what happens then, we train them. We train these weights too. We don't only train the, the weights corresponding to the SVM, we train all weights. And when we train these weights, it means implicitly that we're training the kernel itself. 
So the neural network not only is providing the, us the kernel trick, but it is also trying to adjust the kernel itself. It tries to find the best kernel for us. It does so by training these weights. So at initialization, at initialization, this is true. After that, a neural network uh, trains the weights, wij, and therefore it trains the kernel. And if I adjust the kernel to the needs of this network itself. And that is something that support vector machines, the kernel trick itself does not provide. In the kernel trick, we're supposed to, we're supposed to um, build to choose the kernel, for example, this one, or maybe this one, and just stick with that kernel and run the, the machine, right? But the neural network adjusts this kernel. It tries to find the best kernel for you implicitly. So that's maybe, that's maybe that is, that is going on. Some people argue that, that uh, in fact, the kernel doesn't change much. If you train these weights, then the weights, uh, the, 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 the weights at the beginning of the network, they are not, they train, they change a little bit, but not too much, in fact. And that's because you train them by back, back propagation. So back propagation affects the, uh, the first layers better than, um, than the, the distant past. But I don't know. In practice, we, we probably see that this, this, the weights are actually changing. So we don't, and we don't have a good theory for that. So part of my, of my team is actually trying to, to, to build a theory for, for neural networks and, and we're still far from it. I think. Okay, but at least there is this difference. The advantage of neural networks that it allows us to choose, uh, it, that itself it itself chooses a kernel. Just so you know, um, we'll not go that that route. But the dynamics of the new neural network dynamics of the prediction function. F, the function that this neural network realizes as it trains is computable. Um, this is described by another kernel, in fact, by the so-called neural tangent kernel. Or NTK, and you can you can read about this. We'll not spend a lot of time on that. The idea being is that you train this network with, with these examples with these patients, and by training, I mean we adjust these weights. And how do we adjust the weights by the gradient descent? So we take the gradient, and we always try going the opposite. Um, these weights, in turn, they determine the the function that the neural network computes. So every time the function that it computes changes, the prediction changes, right there. So what we think about the diagnosis, that, that changes. And how does it change with each weight? That's an important question. Like a new patient arrives, what do we actually know from, what do we learn from that new patient, right? The new labeled patient arrives, that's a new piece of experience. And our brain and maybe the computer's brain then thinks, oh, okay, I didn't know that they have this test and this diagnosis. So let me adjust my, my, you know, my diagno diagnostic ability. Um, and the diagnostic ability is this function f. How does it adjust? The dynamics is governed by the neural tangent kernel that will not describe it. It's, it's simple. We can actually check it. So kernels are everywhere. And that ends our long journey that started from Groth and Dieck, semi-definite relaxation, going into kernels and then into, into modern machine learning. There's a lot of questions here uh, that we do, not, we do not know the answers to, especially about neural networks. Because as opposed to the, to the support vector machines, these methods are very, very much non-convex. 
it's a composition it's a composition of many layers and every time you include a layer it includes a new nonlinearity and so there's a very nonlinear function there that computes and we don't it's not clear how to address that any any questions I have a question about the first part when we were discussing just S SVM. So, and well, we spent some time on trying to understand uh, what makes a kernel a kernel, right? And what will happen if I apply this kernel trick, but with for when k of x y is not a kernel? So what, yeah. what That's can a I expect? Cool yeah, it's a cool question. I don't know actually. I never tried that. Have anyone tried this before? I I didn't try. Because formally you can do this, right? Nobody stops you from just applying it, putting in the computer anything you want. So yeah. Oh. Huh. I'm okay, I'm trying to think. So f of x, x may be negative, but that's all right. Come on, try it and tell me what you see. <laughs> try something crazy, like something very non-kernel. Something where it's my like. K of x, x is negative or something like that. Uh, okay, that would be interesting. Very interesting experiment, yeah. Because you can just, you don't have to reinvent everything, right? You just, you can find this kernel SVM, maybe in Python already has a realization of that, and you can put your own kernel there. That would be interesting. Uh, I also have another question. Mm -hmm. like it's a regularization uh like uh the one you showed uh are there other forms of regularization that are that are popular uh for kernel svm i don't know but there are others yeah let me that's a very good question actually it's a very good question okay so here's here's one that's extremely extremely uh important and popular okay. so first of all what are we doing here so what is w w is the set of weights sign of wx so this is let me rewrite this sign of w1 uh, w1x1 plus and so on and so forth, W, D, X, D, where I just did the sum over different parameters or different test results. Okay. It is reasonable to assume that not all the tests are as in, are, are equally important, that in fact, there are some tests that are redundant and the doctors just like to prescribe the tests. And here, in the United States, we pay a lot of money for the test. So maybe, you know, the doctors just prescribe a lot of tests in hoping that there is a small part, maybe two tests, maybe three tests that are very important for the cancer and the rest are just junk and they just know, don't know, they just overproductive, okay? Same thing with genes. Maybe, maybe it's a genetic thing. Maybe it's not the test. Maybe there's genes one through D and some of the genes, some combination of the genes, maybe 17 genes predicts this type of cancer. And the rest is just junk. And the rest is just 55,000 genes or whatever, they're just junk. So you would like to identify these conclusive tests or these conclusive genes. Which, like, which three tests are more important? Which 17 tests are more important? And for that, the uh, good regularization is to, a good regularization to have instead of that would be the number of non-zero Ws. So you would like to have as many zero WIs as possible. So the sum will have very few terms, just you know, test one, test three, and test 15. That's important. And the rest are just Ws. The weights are zero and there is nothing. So that is something that, that people would like to have. Unfortunately, that number is not is, is a combinatorial number. You can't really, no. it's very discrete. You can do the gradient descent on it and something like this. So you um, you replace it with with the L one norm. 
which is just the sum the sum of yeah sorry the sum of w i's from one to d and i'll i'll explain in a second why you choose a one norm why why would that be a good proxy but is is the reasoning clear like you have you want a very sparse w in terms of coordinates and for sparsity you want to penalize something like this um why that why why a one norm okay so you have a you guys know what lp norms are right so p norm p is w i to the p okay now if p goes to infinity then this goes to this converges to l infinity which is the maximum of the coordinates but if p goes to zero becomes crazy because for p less than one it's not a norm but we can still formally take that mm -hmm. if p goes to zero that actually converges to i <laughs> believe what it will be fun so if p goes to zero it converges to this <laughs> there's a number of non-zero elements which makes sense to to define as w zero <laughs> It goes to zero so we define this as w0 as, as p0 norm it's not a norm at all but it's just this metaphor is a support so w i's non-zero okay now w0 is not a norm and that's how you can't really regularize by just replacing this with w0 and you want to find the smallest p that is a norm so and so that one half is not a norm like three fourths is not, but one is a norm so you replace it with the smallest p that is a norm and that's and that's how how you do this and this produces usually good results it produces w that is very sparse so as a result it not only gives you separation but it also tells you which tests are the most important ones or which genes are the most important ones that's called sparse Sparse SVM, I guess. The sparsity is a keyword here. So it's sparse machine learning. So that's another very important regularizer. Good. Yeah, great. Thanks. It, yeah. it kind of makes sense that uh, we want to penalize these things very close to zero, but not zero in the hardest possible way and then power of one is actually like the best we, we, we can do yeah. exactly yeah. yes okay yeah, great thanks yep yeah you're welcome yeah it was a great question yeah. any other questions okay all right perfect guys thank you so much for coming and staying with me online that helps me too <laughs> helps you too so please come and I will stop recording now and you work on your homework. If you, like this one is important, I think. So if you, problems three and four, especially problems three and four, they are, you are reproving the theorem from 2005. You're actually rediscovering this, this important thing. So please, please do that. Um,